Hi, I'm Robin Morella, your host today on Launchbox. Get ready to blast off on your mark. Get set. Launchbox. This is a show that brings space down to earth just for kids, and we're bringing it right into your classroom. Today's show is about forces. How do objects move on earth? How do objects move in space? Who is this Newton guy anyway? Well, we're going to try to answer some of these questions for you. In fact, let's go to a classroom to learn about Newton's laws. You know, it was about 350 years ago when an English scientist named Sir Isaac Newton discovered the laws of gravity. Now, 350 years later, we're still talking about it. Let's start at the beginning, the front line, law one, otherwise known as the first law of motion. The first half of the law states that a body at rest will stay at rest unless an outside force starts it moving. The second half of the law states that a body in motion will stay in motion in the same direction unless acted upon by an outside force. This is also called the law of inertia or resistance to change. Newton's second law states that a force on an object causes it to accelerate in the direction of the force. And the greater the force, the greater its acceleration. Watch again as our team proves this. Here's our can again. We'll use this little air puffer to apply a gentle force to it for a short time. See, it doesn't accelerate very much. Now we'll apply a greater force. That did it. It really accelerated that time. The greater the force, the greater the can's acceleration. Now, the third law of motion states that for every action by a force, there's an equal and opposite reaction by another force. What happens when Lacey pushes against Greg? The force on each astronaut is equal and opposite, so they go off in opposite directions at the same speed. Next time you make a move, ask yourself, was that the first, second, or third law? Now get out there and abide by these laws. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest today. He's the man who has the final say at the beginning of a mission on whether or not the shuttle goes into space. Here is the launch director for the space shuttle program, Mr. Bob Seek. Bob, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Robin, I really great, appreciate that. Great to be here. I think the first question I want to ask you is when you hear that three, two, one, and you know that shuttle's ready to go, what's going through your mind? Well, prior to the liftoff, I'm looking at all the display data from the computers and the closed circuit television and so engrossed in that, I'm not sure what I'm thinking about. Once the engines ignite and it clears the tower, there's just this tremendous feeling of pride to be part of the team that made that possible. Now, how much the, does the shuttle actually weigh? Well, the, the weight, the gross weight at liftoff with a payload is about six million pounds, or roughly the weight of all the steel here at the pad that we launch from, or the average small building. Okay. Um, how much force does it take to actually lift it off the ground? Well, because the weight of the shuttle is about six million pounds, it takes six million pounds of thrust. Most of that comes from the solid rocket boosters, a smaller amount, about a third of it, from the orbiter main engines. And it provides that thrust all the way through the ascent. Okay, now talking about the boosters, Bob, what would happen if you had three solid rocket boosters? Well, the shuttle would lift off too fast. It'd be like putting a high-performance engine in a real small car. Something would break. And it's not designed to take those acceleration forces, so that wouldn't be a usable thing for us to do. Actually, how many boosters do you use? Well, we use two boosters, and they provide about 5 million pounds of the thrust, and then the main engines in the orbiter provide an additional million pounds. Okay, let's talk about gravity. Now, why should the term microgravity be used instead of zero gravity? Well, microgravity is a term we use in Earth orbit because if there is something in Earth orbit, it's still being attracted to the center of the Earth because of the gravity. Even though it's further away, 
than you and I are, it still has that attraction. So there's a little bit of gravity as any object, a satellite, a spacecraft, or shuttle orbits the Earth. You have to totally escape the pull of the Earth's gravity in order to have zero gravity, and that's so far out in space that now you're being attracted by the gravity of some other planet or the moon or a star. So there's always a little bit of gravity anywhere on Earth or in space. How much gravity is pushing against the astronauts at liftoff? Well, at liftoff, the astronauts are in their seats, seated like you and I are, but they're leaning back, and they have one G, as it were, the same amount of weight that we have. As the vehicle accelerates, there's more gravity, and that's multiplied by two or three times. They feel very heavy during the first part of the ascent phase. Bob, how do they prepare the astronauts for the gravity force? Is there any preparation you have to give astronauts? Well, the training, in addition to high-speed aircraft, they have a gravity simulator where they would spin the, the astronauts around to simulate and actually induce higher gravity forces on their body. And then they have a zero-g simulator or microgravity simulator, which is an airplane, and they spend many hours in that so they can get the feeling of low gravity and higher gravity relative to what we have right here. How much energy or fuel does it take to launch the space shuttle? Well, it takes a lot. The total amount of propellant is uh, enough to give you about 80 million horsepower. And 80 million horsepower would be about as much as you'd get if you'd take uh, most of the high performance sports cars in any big city and run them at high speed all at the same time. Okay, now how far into the sky does the shuttle need to go before it escapes our gravity? Well, it would, the average weight of the, the shuttle for liftoff would be 90 to 100 miles above the Earth. It's got just enough gravity to continue to circle the Earth. In order to escape that and go off to another planet, uh, it would have to go out many thousands of miles and have additional thrust to get it there. What is the difference between gravity in space and gravity on Earth? Well, the only difference is the amount of gravity that you have. Uh, there's still some there. You can induce more g-forces or gravity by spinning or tumbling, but there's still a little bit. You just don't feel it as much. For instance, the moon has about one-sixth the gravity that the Earth has, and it's less because it's a smaller body. It still has gravity. Is it hard for astronauts to adjust to being back on Earth? Well, depending on the amount of time they've been gone, it may take a few hours or a few minutes. The analogy is if you were riding on a carnival ride that really wound you up quite a bit, and when it stops and you get out and put your feet on the ground, you're a little dizzy and disoriented until you walk around a little bit. It's the same feeling. Bob, again, thanks so much for spending time with us today. Well, it was great. And next out there, I dare you to check this out. It's time to fasten your seatbelts and get ready to reach new heights as we blast off on LaunchBox's very own version of Double Dare. And here's your host, one of the first to actually immerse herself in slime. Here's Robin Moreau. Welcome to LaunchBox's Double Dare. We have a great crowd here with us today at Nickelodeon Studios in Orlando, Florida. We also have two super teams, so let's meet them. On the blue team to the right, we have the Space Cadets. Hi, guys. Hi. Where are you from? We're from Albany, New York. That's New York State's capital. We're glad to have you here. We're equally as glad to have you guys here. The red team, we call you the Rocketeers. Where are you from? We're from Salt Lake City, Utah. Another beautiful area. Well, good luck to both teams. We want to find out which team has the right stuff. Now, the Rocketeers, you won our coin toss, so you'll have control of the game. Good luck again. Here we go. Here's our first question. True or false, Rocketeers, Newton's first law of motion states that a body at rest stays at rest unless an outside force starts it moving. Is it true or false? True. Way to go, guys. You get the point. You're off to a great start, and you keep control as we go on to question number two. That's right. You guys can clap out there. You're doing wonderful. Here we go. Question number two. Why should the term microgravity 
be used instead of zero gravity? Is it A, because Newton said that it should, B, there is gravity in space, it's just far less than on Earth, or C, gravity was not invented until the early 1970s, so zero gravity is outdated. Um, there. Okay, Space Cadets, it's your first time again. Why should the term microgravity be used instead of zero gravity? Is it A, because Newton said that it should? B, there is gravity in space, it's just far less than on Earth. Or C, gravity was not invented until the early 1970s, so zero gravity is outdated. Um, um, we're gonna double there. Okay, guys, you want me to go through it again? Again, why should the term microgravity be used instead of zero gravity? Is it A, B, or C? Physical challenge. Okay, the answer is B. There is gravity in space. It's just far less than on Earth. Okay, guys, our first physical challenge. Come on down. Okay, we're ready to go. This, this physical challenge is called Shooting Star. Who's going to get in our contraption there? Okay, Debbie, you're going to come over here with me. The object is to get two of these wonderful looking shooting stars into the contraption, okay? Again, two in the contraption. You have 20 seconds. Audience, let's hear you cheer them on. Okay. Right over there, Debbie. Okay, best of luck, good luck, guys. On your mark, get set, go! Come on, cheer them on. There's one, way to go, Debbie. Okay, Beth, you might want to stay still there. It might be easier if you stay still, Beth. Way to go, Rocketeers. You take a commanding lead. Let's wait till Beth gets out of our shooting star contraption. Come on back up, Beth. Okay, we're on to our next question. What is the definition of gravity? Is it A, it's when you can't walk on the space shuttle, B, resistance to change, or C, it's the force of attraction or pull between any two pieces of matter? Rocketeers? There. Okay, cadets. What is the definition of gravity? C. C, that's right. It's the force of attraction or pull between any two pieces of matter. Way to go, Space Cadets. You're back in this. Okay, it's up to you. I'm going to describe a scene. You tell me which one of Newton's laws it explains. Here it goes. A fireman turns on a water hose. Water comes rushing out the nozzle as he braces himself to hold on. Okay, is it the first? second, or third law of motion. Space cadets? Um, dare, we're gonna dare. Okay, okay, Rocketeers, you heard the story. Is it the first, second, or third of Newton's laws? We're gonna double dare. You're gonna double dare? Okay, space cadets again. Yes, is it the first, second, or third of Newton's laws? The third? Way to go, it's the third law for every action. For example, water squirting out the nozzle. There is an equal and opposite reaction force, the hose being pushed back toward the fireman. Nice job, Space Cadets. You gain control. Let's continue. One, def one definition of force is any push or pull on an object. Is that true or false? Space Cadets? Um, true. You're doing great. That's right. It's true. Way to go, guys. Here we go again. What is your weight? Don't answer it yet. Is it A, a measure of the force of gravity on you, B, the amount of space you take up, or is it C, 17 pounds? Dare? Okay, Rocketeers, again. What is your weight? Is it A, a measure of the force of gravity on you, B, the amount of space you take up, or C, 17 pounds? Is it A, um, a measure of the force of gravity on you? That's right, guys. That's wonderful. Way to go. Let's put the points up on the board. Guys, that means it's a tie score. It's coming down to our last toss-up. I need all four of you guys to sit down on the floor. Way to go, guys. It comes down to our final toss-up to see who our grand prize winner is. Okay, it's time to fill the tank. Our researchers have found a way to get fuel out of a wet tile. Okay, guys, why don't you go ahead and set up. Scott, you come there. There we go. 
Okay, what you have to do is take these towels, pass them to your partner. The first one to fill above this line is our grand prize winner for the day. Okay, get those wet towels ready, guys. Good luck to both teams. On your mark. Get set, go! <laughs> Tell them what they've won. Okay, Robin, our winners have won a sun vacation getaway, a visit to Mercury, the closest planet to the sun. They'll be able to bake during the day in the balmy temperature of 350 degrees centigrade. So pack your suntan lotion. I'd recommend an SPF of at least 307. Back to you, sport. Guys, you'll probably have to provide your own transportation. Do you have a good time? Yeah. We did too. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> of ways that space technology affects us here on Earth. And so many things were developed through space research. Check out these examples. Aerodynamic car designs are a result of NASA research. For example, curves reduce drag and improve fuel economy. The frame of these glasses is constructed from a NASA-developed memory metal that can be bent in half and then return back to its original shape without heat. This bicycle racing wheel was designed using NASA technology that helped eliminate the drag caused by the spokes of regular bike wheels. Well, this was just a blast, but before we go, I'd like to thank the Astronauts Memorial Foundation and everyone at NASA for all their help. I'm Robin Morell, and I'm daring you to keep up with space and keep counting down until the next episode of LaunchBox where Nickelodeon comes right into your classroom. We'll see ya. Karen Musser and welcome to the teacher's portion of LaunchBox. Today's episode is about Newton's three laws of motion and how they relate to force. We have a lot of ground to cover, so if you're going too fast, you may want to pause your VCR to take notes. Today's goal is to demonstrate the three laws of motion as they relate to the Earth and space. As always, please preview this unit in order to develop a lesson plan to meet the needs of your grade level and determine the materials required. We suggest you order all the necessary materials before you view LaunchBox with your class. Resources are listed at the end of the lesson plan. About 305 years ago, in 1686, Sir Isaac Newton defined three laws of motion. These laws explain the way in which objects move. Understanding these laws will help you know how objects move on Earth and how objects move in the microgravity environment of space. In order to understand motion, you must first understand force. Force is defined as any push or pull on an object. To describe a force, you must know the size of the force and the direction in which it acts. When you sit down in a chair, your weight exerts a force on the chair seat. The legs of the chair exert an equal force upwards on the chair to hold you up. These two forces are balanced and no motion occurs. Newton's first law of motion states that a body at rest will stay at rest unless an outside force starts it moving. A body in motion will stay in motion in the same direction unless acted upon by an outside force. This is also called the law of inertia. Inertia is a resistance to change. 
An unbalanced force is any force that changes the motion of the object it acts on. There are four ways in which an unbalanced force can affect motion. First, it can cause an object at rest to begin moving. Second, it can cause an object to speed up, for example, when a person on roller skates is pushed from behind. Third, it can cause an object to slow down if it is acting in the opposite direction of the motion. Finally, a force can change the direction of an object in motion. If a roller skater was moving in a straight line and you pulled on his sleeve, the skater would be turned toward the pull. Gravity normally acts as a force on objects on or near the Earth's surface. Gravity is the force of attraction or pull between any two pieces of matter. Near the Earth's surface, the force of gravity is strong, but as an object gets further away, the force becomes much smaller. A rocket needs to have a great deal of force to lift off the ground and accelerate fast enough to reach an orbit around the Earth. While in orbit, gravity is still exerting a force on the rocket. The speed of the rocket and the force of the gravity cause it to orbit the Earth. This is why the shuttle travels in a curved line around the Earth instead of going straight. Recall the example of the skater being pulled by the sleeve. The gravity experienced on the shuttle while in orbit is far less than on the surface of the Earth and is termed microgravity. Because of the curved path that the shuttle travels, it is as if it were continually falling in a circular path around the Earth. Newton's second law of motion states that a force on an object causes it to accelerate in the direction of the force. The greater the force applied to an object, the greater its acceleration. The greater the mass of an object, the smaller its acceleration. In summary, the force applied to a body is equal to its mass times its acceleration. Newton's third law of motion states that for every action by a force, there is an equal and opposite reaction by another force. For the shuttle to travel to space, the exhaust of its rocket engines exerts a downward force and the shuttle moves upward in the opposite direction. Another thing you should know is we just don't float around on the orbiter because there is no gravity. We still feel Earth's gravity. So why are we floating? Because we're falling. Let's say the string is gravity. And let's say this apple is like a spaceship orbiting the Earth. You see, it's gravity and our speed that keeps us in orbit. Without gravity, we would fly off into space and never come back. Here's another example. When I drop this apple on Earth, it falls. When I drop an apple here on the space shuttle, it falls too. It just doesn't look like it's falling. And that's because we're all falling together. The apple, me, and the orbiter. But we're not falling towards the Earth. We're falling around it. Let's imagine that we can send Bruce down to the nearest elevator on Earth. elevator is going to the top of a very tall building. Suddenly, when he reaches the top, the cable breaks, and the elevator car with Bruce in it begins to fall. What will happen inside the elevator? Well, since he's falling, and the elevator is falling at the same rate, he starts to float. His body isn't pushing on the inside of the elevator anymore. He has no weight. He's weightless. If he had an apple with him, it would float too, just like the one in the orbiter, because Bruce, the apple, and the elevator would all be falling together. It'd be a fun ride until he hit the bottom. And that's why things float around up here, even really big things because we're all falling on a curved path around the Earth. This concludes the teacher's portion of LaunchBox. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. For free LaunchBox classroom materials and more information about Nickelodeon's Cable in the Classroom programming, visit Nick's internet website for teachers at teachers.nick.com.
next in Nickelodeon Studios at Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida. The following program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a service of the cable television industry and your local cable company.